Assalamu alaikum everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Mahdiya podcast dedicated to the master of the era, Asahib al Asr was Zaman. As everyone already knows, the listeners, the goal of this podcast is to promote the thought provoking discussions that help with the regards of the teachings of the Ahl al and to develop an understanding of how they are relevant to our lives. We hope to learn from these lessons and apply them to our lives and work towards reaching the level of being ready for the Zahur of Imam Mahdi. So, joining me in today's conversations are brothers Hassan Naqwi, brother Ali Rizvi, and brother Mahdi Jafari. Salamu alaikum, brothers. Wa alaikum as How are you guys doing today? Alhamdulillah. Brother Ali, brother Ali, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, man. I'm happy to be here. Inshallah. Brother Mahdi. Doing well. Um, really excited for this uh, discussion. Inshallah. And brother Hassan Naqwi. Alhamdulillah. This is a very important discussion on Ayam and Fatimiyah. Exactly. Shama. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ayam al Fatima is definitely an important part of uh, the Shia community's lives. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and dive into today's episode, which is about Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra. And in this discussion, we're going to touch upon what we think are a few key points in regard to her life. Because Sayyidah Fatima is a spiritual personality that's honored and revered globally by all the sects of Islam. So we want to touch upon a few points specific to Sayyidah Fatima's life. Number one, we're going to try to discuss the status of her within Islam and her status of being Sayyidah Nisa al Alameen and of course her relation to the Ahl al-Bayt and the Ayyama alayhim as And then number two, we're going to talk about some of the things that we have learned from her or the things that we can learn through Hadith and other various stories and narrations. And then lastly, which is probably going to be our most important topic in this podcast episode is the oppression against her and her endurance and her grief and maybe we're going to even be able to cover up some of the or open up i should say some of the realities of the incident uh regarding her death her martyrdom i should say um we're all very familiar of course with the the famous hadith fatima Minni, fatima is a part of me and i know we're going to talk about the status uh in into detail but in order to get that point started, we're going to have to discuss the ma'rifat of Bibi Fatima, right? Her recognition, what it means to recognize Bibi Fatima. And then we're going to maybe dive into some of the secrets about Bibi Fatima because so little is, is known about her. And I know you guys have done some research into finding out how we can understand from those uh, lessons about her life. And then, of course, her status in the family. She was the best mother, the best wife, and the best daughter to the Ma'sumin. And her familial role is also not a learning point for us, but it's an applicable learning point for us. So let's dive into that first point with the status of Sayyidah Fatima in regard to her recognition, her ma'rifat, right? I know Sayyid Mahdi Jafri is here today, and he has some very crucial points in regards to what it means to recognize the status of Sayyidah Fatima. Brother Mahdi. Mm-hmm. Just to set a precedent for uh, when you say the Ma'rifat to be Fatima, you know, just to emphasize why it's important to have Ma'rifat, the recognition of not only say the Fatima, but the rest of the Aima and the Masumin, is so that, you know, we can understand um, them better and then in turn we can understand Allah better. Yeah. So, you know, when going and looking at the Ma'rifat to be Fatima and, and her status especially, um, you know, I refer to one of the Hadiths um, by Sheikh Tusi inside Misbah Anwar where. He talks about a conversation that Imam Sadiq has with a companion, Mufazl. And in this hadith, he says, O Mufazl, know that they are informed about whatever Allah the Almighty has created and has fashioned and has initiated. So this hadith sets the precedent that the knowledge that the Alabat have, the knowledge that say the Fatima, Prophet Muhammad have, is very vast. And Allah has created them um, to know all the things that He has bestowed upon the earth or in the oh. whole universe. And however vast the universe is, they have all that knowledge because Allah has given them that. Yeah. So that puts into perspective, you know, the status of the Aima and the Maslameen and especially say the Fatima in between uh, all, uh, for all the, for all the bit. And this uh, conversation between uh, Mufazzal and Imam uh, Sadiq, uh, there's, there's more. He says, and they are the words of piety and the treasures of the heavens and the earths, the mountains and the sands and the oceans. She also says, and they can inform you about the skies, its stars, kingdoms, the weights of mountains and the water of the oceans and streams and fountains. And of 
Of course, he's referring to the Alul Bayt here, and included in the Alul Bayt is Sayyid of Fatima. So this is only a testament to the status of Sayyid of Fatima. So it's important that we understand where her status is before we go into the rest of this podcast. So looking at it, putting it into perspective, uh, we can look at a hadith from Imam Musa Qazim alayhi salam, where he says, um, we the Alul Bayt are the hujjat of Allah on the creatures, while our mother Fatima is the hujjah of Allah upon us. So this hadith tells us what the status of Bibi Fatima is to the Alabat themselves. Right. And and all of the Imams like we know from history that they've not all of them have met Bibi Fatima, but mm-hmm. they talk about her in such a way yeah. that you can understand that they have a connection that's beyond the physical, right? They know that there's something more to her status than what we can even understand, which is incredible. That's a, that's an amazing hadith. I'm glad you're able to share that with us. And that's just hadith, right? We're also going to go into the Quran and how it discusses the status of Sayyida Fatima. And I know Brother Hassan has brought some interesting points from verses from the Quran that discuss some of these things. Yeah, and this is actually a narration that's from Imam Jafar Sadiq in one of the tafsirs where he explains some of the hidden meanings of Surah Al Qadr, where he's reciting Inna Anzalnahu fi Laylatil Qadr. And surely we have revealed it upon the night of Qadr, right? Imam Jafar Sadiq, he explains that this night mentioned in Laylatul Qadr is actually Fatima Alaiha. He says the night is Fatima and Qadr is the decree of Allah. So one who recognizes Fatima with due recognition has attained Laylatul Qadr. See, this, this shows us that there's a high status that the, Allah wants us to achieve through recognizing Sayyidah Fatima Zahra Alaiha. And it also... Uh, Moving forward from it, Imam Jafar Sadiq he explains it even further to another depth. He says, As for Allah's saying, the night of power is better than a thousand months, it means that Fatima Salam Alaiha is better than a thousand believers. Wow. Just to draw a parable about the grand status of Sayyidina Fatima Zahra mm-hmm. and, and the importance of gaining that marifat of her, the Imam he's telling us that. The status of Sayyidah Fatima is such a highly respected status and if you were to truly understand her position among the Masumin within this uh, realm of existence and under- understand the wisdom behind her existence, it would increase the level of honor and respect that we have for her and the Ahlul Bayt and in turn increase our spirituality and in turn achieving Laylatul Qadr. Wow. And let's look at what uh, the Holy Prophet says about Bibi Fatima. He says, Fatima is the joy of my heart. Her two sons, Hassan and Hussein, are the fruits of my heart. Her husband is the light of my eyes, and the Imams from her progeny are the trustees of my Lord. An extended rope between him and his creatures. Whoever fastens unto them will be saved, and whoever lags behind them will be destroyed. Yeah, and this is coming from the Holy Prophet Keeping in mind that in the Quran, it explains that he doesn't even speak out of his own desire. Every word that the Prophet says is from the side of Allah. And so when he's saying these statements, this is actually Allah making this statement through Rasulullah himself. And there's a reason why Rasulullah points out the high status and position of the Ahl Bayt and we'll inshallah get into that point later on in this discussion okay i kind of want to go back to that hadith that you just mentioned brother. maybe you can expand on that a little bit more well considering all that we've said about sayyid fatima so far it's important that we understand who she really was sayyid fatima was the daughter of the last holy prophet the wife of Hazrat Ali, the door to the city of knowledge, the mother of Hassan and Hussein, Imam Hassan who was the first successor to Hazrat Ali and Hussein who fought for and saved the religion of Islam by sacrificing his life and his family's life. She was the mother of Sayyidah Zainab, someone who stood in the palace of Yazid and dismantled the fortitude of falsehood that the oppressors stood on. This was Fatima. Wow, wow. That really gets, puts into perspective the status of Sayyidah Fatima. I mean, you guys have definitely done a fair share of research into trying to open the secrets and really try, really start to try and understand who she really was. Because like, I think we all know there's very little that is talked about in her life. With that being said, I think we can move on to try and discuss what are the things that we do know and maybe what are some of the things that we can learn from her life. 
I know that we have some very interesting hadiths um, that you, Brother Mahdi or Brother Hassan, maybe you guys uh, can dive into a little bit of that. So yeah, so just looking at um, Tawheed in general that we get from the Alabath, one of the great things about being a Shia is that the Alabath have given us so many hadiths on Tawheed itself. Right, it's something that we can pride ourselves on and learn a lot because they give us it's so fundamental. much fundamental. Yeah. Exactly. So much content. And just like Brother Hassan was sharing a narration with me earlier, if you want to go into it a little bit. You mean the narration about Tawheed from Sayyidah? Yeah. Yeah, so this is from the book of Biharul Anwar and this contains a treasure of knowledge. And this statement, Sayyidah Fatima Zahra, she explains a level of Tawheed where she says, Lam absar, that visions do not comprehend him. Visions do not comprehend Allah. And descriptions do not encompass him. And measures do not de determine him. And thoughts cannot, thoughts cannot imagine him. Because he is the king, the subjugator. Yeah, when I first heard that narration, uh, immediately what came to my mind is that in order to, to give content like this a description like this you have to have a very close relationship with Allah which we can tell Bibi Fatima definitely had and uh, you know just thinking earlier throughout the day um, you know as Shias we always see ourselves our defining uh, moment as you know Muharram or whether it be the Vilayat of Imam Ali on the day of Ghadir but what we sometimes kind of forget is that you know, every day we commemorate Bibi Fatima and what she stood for every day we read Tazbiya Fatima every, after every single namaz and that's a reminder of not only who she was, but her connection with Allah, how she glorified Allah through that does be Pointing towards Tawheed every yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And the teachings that we have from her, the pure teachings of Islam from the Ahlul Bayt, they go to another level of depth. They have, they have such immense uh, divine insights within them. Sayyidina Fatima Zahra, she was also called Muhaddasa because the angels, they used to descend from the heaven and said, O oh, Fatima, Allah has chosen you above the women of all nations. Where the angel explains to her the virtues and the fazail of Rasulullah And this is part of what, what is written within Mus'haf of Fatima. And it also contains the records of every major event that will take place until the Day of Judgment. And Fatima's book, Mus'haf in comparison to the Quran, in comparison to the Quran, Imam Jafar Sadiq salam, he explains that it's actually three times, uh, three times larger than the size of the Quran itself. But this does not, however, mean that it outvies the Quran in any sense. So I think we've made it pretty clear and we've established that there's a lot to learn from Sayyidah Fatima, from the Hadiths, from the narrations, from the stories that we have. And you guys gave a beautiful Hadith in the very beginning regarding Tawheed, which is a fundamental pillar of Islam. And that really goes to show you that the, even with the little that we know about her, there's still so much we can learn from her life. Um, but I think, but I think that the most important part is what we need to talk about next, and that's because it's regarding the oppression against her. Right? We've already established as a high status, uh, an incredible figure, a role model for the people of this world and for the other worlds as well. But you have to ask, how did this incident, this the de her death specifically, her martyrdom, how did that take place if people did really understand her status? Did they not understand? And the things that they were doing, if they were just so subtle and not many people knew out about it, they were sometimes in some certain books, they're shown as being buried into the ground. But these were actually crimes, right? And you guys have done your research on that as well. And, and hopefully we can shed some light into what pe most people consider as gray area around Sayyidah Fatima or even the successorship or the Khilafat, as we would like to call it. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty evident the status of, of Sayyidah Fatima. Brother Ali mentioned her earlier as well. You know, there's the Hadith and it comes from Sayyidah Bukhari where it says Fatima is a part of me and he who makes her angry makes me angry. And In this Bukhari? Is from, this is from Bukhari yeah, and this is okay. from Prophet Muhammad. So Prophet Muhammad is narrating that those who anger say the Fatima also anger me. Mm. And in turn, like Brother Ali mentioned earlier, that ultimately you're going to be also ang angering Allah if, you, if you're angering the Prophet. Yeah. So her status is well known, and there's no denying what her status is. Yeah. If Prophet Muhammad has narrated it, of course, and this comes from Sayyid Bukhari, there's no denying it. 
So yeah. all, all Muslims, every era, even back then, even today, people know who, what her status is. This hadith clearly defines that, okay? Yeah, and when you really dissect this hadith, you start to understand that the true distinguisher between a believer and a non-believer is Fatima. Even the opponents believe that and participate in the commemoration of Imam Hussein, but only a believer can truly recognize and grieve on the tragedy tragedy of Janabi Fatima. That's a that's a really good point. I, I think mean, that's she a... indeed is the chief of all women of all times and the lady of the women of paradise. Yeah, man, absolutely. You see, and in fact, the crime against Sayyidah Fatima Zahra was actually a crime against Rasulullah himself, against his own, against his command. He commanded the Muslims to act ethically and he commanded them to show respect to the Ahlul Bayt and, and obey them. But instead, we see that instead the, the people they had disobeyed, disobeyed and they, yeah, had dis they had complete disregard of the Ahlul Bayt. Okay, I kind of want to go back to what you guys were talking about. Brother Ali, maybe you can narrate kind of exactly what happened once she got uh, okay, to the courtyard. Yeah. So, right. I mean, when because she was ask. giving the sermon of Fadak, I mean, she was um, giving Quranic ayat. She was saying, did you not read where it says, and Suleiman inherited Dawood? This is Surah uh, number 27, verse 16. So this is showing in the Quran that there were inheritances from the Prophet. Yeah. So how does the inheritance from Rasulullah to Sayyidah Fatima make any difference? Okay. And it also narrates, and... That's not just the only narration, it's also narrated that in the story of Zakariah. So give me an heir as from yourself, one that will inherit me and inherit the, uh, the posterity of Yaqub. So Sayyidah Fatima, she gives this uh, ayat and she goes on to say, You claim that I have no share and that I do not inherit my father. She said, Did Allah reveal a Quranic verse regarding you from which he excluded my father? Wow, that's a pretty clear-cut statement. I don't think there should be any confusion around that. Yeah. Um, and this, you said, was in uh, the, the khutbah that she gave, right? Yeah. Khutbah of Fadakiya. See, the khutbah of Fadakiya, I would recommend everybody to look into it. Everybody, you know, search up khutbah of Fadakiya and read it. Because this, this contains a lot of gems, if you read within this. And Sayyidah Fatima Zahra, she, she's addressing the Muslims in this khutbah. And she's reminding them of the covenant that they had made with Rasulullah on the day of Adir and defending the wilayats of Amir al muminin And this is a lesson for us to be ready for the defense of the Imam of the time, to come and defend the wilayat of Amir al muminin Just like how she did, she set us the example for us. And in turn, she made the conclusive argument for her rights and for the right of all Ahl bayt yeah, and you know, just going off what you said, Brother Hassan, it, it's very evident that she was not only angry, but there was definitely oppression going on. If you look, as you said, into the khutbah of Fadakiyah, and uh, there's verses in the Quran where um, Allah talks about, you know, what it means to the etiquettes of coming in to uh, one's, one's house or the etiquette of uh, even entering the Prophet's house. And uh, just looking at that, the incident that happened where people tried to barge inside the house, and they did barge into the house to say the Fatima. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur verse 27, O you who believe, do not enter houses other than your own houses until you have asked permission and saluted their, in their inmates. This is better for you that you may be mindful. So here Allah sets the precedent of etiquette into entering a house. Right? And he continues in Surah Azab verse 53, he says, O you who believe, do not enter the houses of the Prophet unless permission is given to you. So now this sets the boundary of what it means to enter the house of anyone and it's specifically entering the house of the prophet and you know there's narrations where uh prophet muhammad would not only even even going to his own daughter's house say the fatima's house where he would say assalamu alaikum three times before he even entered the house of say the fatima and Imam Ali. and he would only enter if he got a response so even prophet muhammad sets that etiquette for us yeah so it's unbelievable when we see things when we see the events that took place that day where people just come into the house with no regard for the etiquette that has been set by the prophet by prophet muhammad and by allah already and so you know we can we can ask from that event um you know one of the questions that comes to my mind is why did say the fatima answer the door why was she there why was not a mom ali there it's a question that's kind of asked often between yeah, yeah. in our community it's a common question yeah. yeah yeah that's uh i mean that's a really important question that needs to be addressed because to distinguish between who is on the path of truth and who is on the path of uh, falsehood 
who is on the side of justice and who is on the side of injustice so when sayyida fatima zahra she answered the door this was to fulfill that conclusive arguments against anybody who is going to go against her because if somebody was to know that she is behind the door and keeping in mind the respect that she has the status that she has within the muslim community they should have backed off and they should not have burned that uh, they should have not have burned their house it's almost like it was a warning yeah once say the fatima orders the door or um opens the door yeah when you see who's behind it it should remind you of the prophet immediately yeah so yeah that basically i guess highlights the point that you guys mentioned earlier about fatima is a part of me and whoever angers me angers allah right because at this point you know say the fatima was angry and this is basically rasulullah telling them to not do these things this was the manifestation of what that hadith meant yeah and i mean uh moving on from there the holy quran says for those who troubled the prophet surely those who trouble allah and his apostle allah has cursed them in this world and the hereafter and he has prepared them for them a chastisement bringing disgrace this is our surah ahzab verse number 57 Muslims in general are in denial of the attack but there's so many evidences that prove such attacks from their books and they have tried various tricks to defend it. So going off what you said brother Ali uh it's very true that they do try to cover it up and be in denial about it looking at uh the views of Ibn Taymiyyah um the founder of what we see as modern day Salafi is um is that uh Ibn Taymiyyah says that um he creates a big rational imaginative argument on for the reason why Uh, Umar came into the house of uh, say the Fatima he says that he Umar barged into the house of Fatima to see if there was something from Allah's money to distribute it or give it to those who deserved it now we can see clearly through the evidences that we have presented earlier from the Quran from the hadiths of Prophet Muhammad that definitely there's etiquette to entering the house itself you don't itself. just barge into just, a house yeah you can't just barge into the house to say the Fatima wait so this this book that you said uh, or this this, this hadith claim. it comes from Minhaj al Sunnah And, and if I we mean, that's not a denial though that's just trying to cover up something and it doesn't even sound good and if we had yeah. to believe it was true were there any exceptions in the quranic ayat that said um you can barge into a prophet's house i, I don't remember seeing exception <laughs> no, for that. i don't recall any i don't recall any Do I, don't, i don't see anything i mean that just really shows you know how much they try to cover up and how much they try to deny and how much they try to come up with fake even i mean coming up with a fake explanation, rep- explanation of why you know uh the khulafa did the things that they did is completely rejecting everything that the prophet stood for everything that sayyida fatima stood for i mean people say oh it's gray area around sayyida fatima and her death and you shouldn't talk too much about it but if you start opening books and weren't and these these books aren't just our books these are books that you guys have said are from other sources other sects even other you know parts of islam that are are less prominent but everyone knows the status of sayyida fatima so it should be very clear black and white there should be no great there is no great area when it comes to her death yeah the oppression the oppression that the ahlul bayt had faced it's too apparent if you look into the history of of islamic history you would see that it's too apparent that the ahlul bayt they have always been oppressed starting from sayyida fatima zahra uh, muhsin bin ali muhsin ibn ali the son of imam ali that was killed in this attack as well and also going down the bloodline of rasulullah to imam hussein and his family and see the grandchildren of the rasulullah were being slaughtered by the same people who claimed to follow his religion yeah i mean and just going off that it's we could see it evidently you don't have to be a muslim to see these things you know you have to be human to see that what yeah. what is justice and what's injustice is something that we can identify in the world today just looking at just different events so there's definitely a way for anyone who's even read history who knows the story of Fatima who knows what happened to her on that day who knows what happened to any of the other bad who knows basic etiquette yeah. and i mean that there's always been injustice against them and this yeah. is just an instance that has started it and uh throughout history because of what happened to say the Fatima we've seen it go throughout all the other bad and what the oppression that they've had to face now um it really puts all of this into perspective as a whole is that Imam Hussein was killed in Saqifa not necessarily mm-hmm. in Karbala you know this shows us this is where it all started this is the root of the oppression that the Alabath had to face. Yeah, absolutely. So alhamdulillah, I think we've definitely cleared up some of the doubts, not some of the doubts. We've made it black and white uh the truth and what's falsehood when it comes to the death of Sayyida Fatima, the martyrdom of Sayyida Fatima. 
with that i think uh we'll take our leave inshallah uh, we would like to thank all the listeners for tuning into this episode of the mahdiya podcast uh and we are like we mentioned at at the end of each episode this is available on google podcast spotify and youtube and all the other podcast streams uh hopefully if there are any other uh questions um well inshallah try to address them in future episodes so keep a lookout for those um i think definitely we, we now that we've discussed the status of sayyidah fatima and know who she really is and know the truth behind the incidents and that it's very apparent in books uh we would like to encourage everyone and urge everyone to try to read up on her life and the incident to verify for themselves um inshallah i think with that we'll take our leave Thank you again, brothers, for joining on today's episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa